Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Digital Hammurabi. I am your host, Megan Lewis, and today I am delighted to be joined again by Dr. Francesca Stavrakopoulou. I practiced that in my head like eight bazillion times, and I got it perfect each time. And when I say your name in conversation, I get it right. And then the instant there is a camera on me, I'm like, Bobby so, well, I'm, I'm the same. <laughs> <laughs> this is Dr. Francesca Stavrakopoulou, who is a professor at the University of Exeter. Um, I suspect most of our viewers will be familiar with you. Uh, we've obviously talked before, but if you could give a brief introduction, that would be really helpful for those who are new. Yeah, um, so I'm Professor of Hebrew Bible and Ancient Religion um, at Exeter. Before that, I was at the University of Oxford for a number of years. Um, I did all my degrees there, including my doctorate. And then I had a few years um, as a postdoctoral lecturer and tutor um, and researcher. And yeah, I I love the Bible, um, but I'm an atheist. I always have been, always will be. Um, but it's a fascinating collection of texts and you can't really understand these texts without understanding uh, the cultural, social, historical context in which these really beautiful, complex, difficult, troubling literature emerged. Um, so that's what I do. Thank you very much. And actually, I wasn't planning on asking this, but given that you brought it up, I thought we could very briefly cover it because it's something that actually um, Josh gets asked. As an atheist, why on earth are you studying the Bible? Yeah, why not though? Um, oh, right, Bible, exactly. It's, yeah, it's it's um people ask me that all the time. I always say, you know, people never kind of like you know ask historians who like specialize in like why <laughs> Shakespeare. Well, if you're not a Nazi, why are you studying not? <laughs> um, yeah, I I just it's it's always religion has always intrigued me ever since I was a kid. Um, and I think given the impact that the Bible's had on our own cultural context, you know, whether we're believers or not, it plays a huge role. Um, sometimes explicitly, but sometimes it's more implicit. Um, and I think it's really important to be able to understand this anthology of of texts and people who, um, particularly those people that kind of brandish the Bible and use it as a weapon against other people. That annoys me because mm -hmm. um, quite often they don't actually understand what the Bible is, is they're talking about. So um, I think it's really, in a way, culturally responsible to be able to, to study these texts. Um, and as I said, I've always been really fascinated by it. I mean, it's an amazing collection of literature and it's a bit like time travel, you know, you get to kind of like go back and think yourself into particular sorts of ancient contexts um, in ways that perhaps we don't tend to allow ourselves to do um, in quite the same way with other sorts of literature that's important. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, so we are here to talk about Dr. Stavrakopoulou's new book, which is mm. called god and anatomy this is the american cover it's all red and shiny and it's beautiful um the british cover is blue and has a most glorious set of footprints on the front and josh was a little bit disappointed that we got the american version <gasps> look see it's it's beautiful and then the american cover they're both beautiful they are both beautiful yeah, i'm like kind of like you know all right big time look at these two books <laughs> I just happened to write them. They're just <laughs> sitting here on my desk. Um, so, and actually starting with, with the Bible as a kind of misunderstood text is, is possibly an excellent place to start because um, this book is about the physical body of God, mm. which I think many Christians will be deeply surprised to hear is an actual thing because as, as it says in the foreword of the book, it's Christianity often depicts God as this... Um, kind of very unseeable, unknowable, floaty, spiritual type thing, um, which is quite anathema to how ancient people viewed their deities and how ancient religions worked. So how how do you um, start to understand the physical body of God through the Old Testament? Um, I think one of the main things you have to do is to take some of these texts seriously. So there are lots of examples, um, obviously, that I've discussed in the book, in the Bible in which, you know, various biblical characters see God, encounter God, you know, they see his feet, they see his face, they see his backside. Um, it talks about God having a human shaped body, um, talks about people being created in the image of God. And normally, you know, within Jewish and Christian tradition, these things are interpreted very metaphorically, you know, this is figurative language, this is poetic language. But actually in the context in which these texts were written, it wasn't simply metaphor um, or, or poetry. This was 
indexing much more widespread ideas that deities, most deities had human shaped bodies um, and Yahweh, the God of the Bible, was was no exception. One of the interesting things that we see happening in the biblical text, both the New Testament and the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament, is that there's a real tension between wanting to hang on to that very intimate, um, personal, sociable deity. And that's, you know, that all this body language of the deity, um, whilst at the same time becoming increasingly uncomfortable with the idea that this was a God who could be in a particular place at a particular time. And so mm. we start to see some of those tensions emerging in the literature um, and particularly in the New Testament. But yeah, I mean, it's, the, you know, people of people who have read the book already kind of tweet me and say, I wasn't expecting, you know, I was reading you saying that, you know, this part of God's body and you were referring to this biblical text. I looked in my Bible and there it was. I couldn't believe it. It's like, well, yeah, this is there in the text. I'm not making it up. <laughs> It, no, it's 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 interesting that, um, and I think something that a lot of of people encounter when they start looking at the Bible more um, as a historical document rather than text of faith, um, that actually there is an awful lot in there that is maybe glossed over or maybe just not really paid a lot of attention to, because it, it's kind of problematic from a modern religious standpoint. Um, not least yeah. of which is God having a physical form. Yeah. And I and I think, you know, we, we talk about, you know, a physical form. What do we mean by that? You know, that there was a sense in which he had a material body. You know, the materiality wasn't the same as human materiality mm. in the sense of, you know, um, this kind of fleshy, bloody um, sort of mass. But at the same time, various, you know, to be divine was not to be immaterial. Mm. So the big point in a lot of biblical texts is that yes god has a body but it's but the scandal or the kind of the the wonder about god's body is that it's usually hidden and so it you know it's remarkable that he allowed some people in the past to see it so um you know so moses sees it amos isaiah ezekiel abraham um so you know you get all these kind of important figures um who are said to have seen the deity or parts of his body his parts of his anatomy but I, but I think it is. It's it's about understanding these texts within their ancient cultural context and understanding that even the ways in which um, human bodies were understood to kind of function and operate were, were slightly different than the ways in which we understand them today. You know, we are the we have inherited this very um, th this this very strong idea that somehow you know the mind is separate from the body and and that you know the the intellect is is of a it's greater value somehow intellectually, you know, spiritually, um, than, than somehow, you know, that messy base fleshy stuff, you know, that somehow our bodies are objects that simply house us as people. Um, but that's a, that's a much later philosophical idea drawn on very platonic notions. Um, but, but the people that were producing these texts didn't, didn't really see bodies like that, whether they were divine or human. Fascinating. Thank you. Um, so going through the book, what um, evidence do you have to draw on that maybe isn't in the biblical text or are you very much restricted to the Hebrew Bible? Um, no, I cover um, Hebrew Bible and New Testament and other early Jewish and Christian texts that didn't make it into the, the Christian canon. Um, but then I also draw on a huge amount of archaeology, um, anthropology, a lot of material culture and iconography from other ancient Southwest Asian cultures. So lots of Mesopotamian stuff, um, Egyptian stuff, um, Phoenician. So, yeah, it's um, it's it was it was a brilliant book to write in the sense that it gave me a chance to to really think about all the stuff that I find really interesting anyway. And to do the kind of stuff that I do in my in my teaching in my undergraduate and postgraduate classes. Um, but yeah, so it's it's a really, I suppose you would call it a transdisciplinary book in that you know okay. it's not just biblical studies or <laughs> you know theology or history. It's got um it's got all sorts of other other things in there. Thank you. And what if you could pick one thing? What do you think people would find the most surprising? Wow! Reading through the book, you I can you can pick more than one if you want to, but um. Most people seem quite shocked by the idea that God had genitals um, and that he was a sexualized deity for some of his ancient worshippers. That doesn't really surprise me that much, um, I guess, because I've always understood this deity in an ancient context to be very much 
like other ancient gods and goddesses of ancient Southwest Asia and Eastern Mediterranean. Um, but I think I think some people find find it surprising. The I um, I don't know. Do they? I don't know. See, I I don't know. I think some people might be surprised by what I'd say about the human body, um, because God's body is very much, you know, this is a deity made in our own image, or rather in the image of those ancient worshippers. Mm -hmm. so I think maybe some people will find the sorts of things that I describe about the ways in which humans understood their bodies to 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 be to be, you know, something that they've not known about before. So, you know, things like the sociality of the feet and, and the various different ways that that feet played important power roles and social roles. Um the way that that breath and air um, wasn't understood to be immaterial, but was understood to be a material kind of substance. So when we read in both Hebrew Bible and New Testament texts about the breath of God, um, this is, you know, this is a, a deity, you know, who is breathing in and out when he has um, his day of rest on the seventh day. You know, we tend to like theologians tend to say, oh, you know, this was about, you know, this, this is about him taking time to reflect on his work, to admire his work, you know, but, you know, a day to not work, literally. Um, but actually, you know, you, you read some of the, the biblical language that's used to talk about it. And, and the language that's used is literally like, you know, he had to catch his breath. It's, it's tired, it's, yeah. He is exhausted from all that speaking, creation into being. He's like, whew, he has to catch his breath. And so there's there's a lot of that, that people like little gorgeous, little vivid details like that, that, that I think people might be surprised by. That's a beautiful image as well, the, the idea of, I've worked so hard and I just need to just physically recuperate yeah. from everything that's just happened. Yeah. One of my other really, one of the other um, really, one of the things that really stays with me about the book is that there's a, a poem in Deuteronomy that talks about um, God looking after his baby son in the wilderness. And um, it's sort of talk about how much he, he loves this little child. Um, you know, and the child here represents as being you. It's drawn on very ancient mythology, I think, but it's being sort of recycled to talk about a relationship between God and, and Israel or Jacob. Mm -hmm. And um, and one of the little details in this beautiful poem, it talks about um, you know, he loved him so much that um, he, and he was the you know the boy was the apple of his eye. That's the way that most English translations render the Hebrew, um, which is sort of it's supplanting one an old Hebrew idiom for an English one. So the apple of, of his eye, you know, the idea mm -hmm. is the eyes people. But like the, the Hebrew idiom more literally refers to the little man reflected in the pupil of the eye. So you get this image of this big eyeball, of, you know, this God looking so intently at this little child that, it, that, that you can see the little reflection of, of the child in God's shiny black pupil. And it's just like, God, that is a beautiful image. That's that, wonderful. Image, that closeness, it's, it's lovely. So it yeah, is. little details like that that you find in the text are just gorgeous. Thank you. Um, when uh, you think about how God, how Yahweh was worshipped in an ancient context, um, something that uh, I think a lot of modern viewers may not consider is is the idea of a cult statue and yeah. and, and a, like a, a physical man-made image of God. You think about like Greek and, and Roman sculptures of, of the gods, and that's very common. Uh, we don't have remains of that kind of thing at least not a lot from um the ancient Near East what's what do you know what can you tell us about um Yahweh as a cult statue well we've got lots of um we've got lots of references in biblical texts to say for example in the Psalms where psalmists will talk about um I can't wait to go into the Jerusalem temple to look upon your beauty to see your face that kind of stuff we have various um references to you know, this is Yahweh saying, you know, behold my image, um, come and look at me. And and that sort of language, um, a lot of scholars now suspect that actually, yeah, that at certain points in his history, um, in his early career, at certain points, um, that this deity was worshipped by means of a cult statue. So in other words, a, a you know, an icon, if you like. Um, and I think what's really important about that is like very much in common with other ancient Southwest Asian cultures, you know, like in Babylonia or Assyria, um, the statue was a manifestation. It wasn't just a representation or a symbol of the deity. It was a manifestation of the deity. So this was understood to be something that was, you know, like in some of those beautiful um, Sumerian examples, um, the idea that this was something you know made it was born in heaven but but made on earth um, mm. that, 
the deity was manifest in material form in this particular way. And I think increasingly scholars are now, Hebrew Bible scholars are now much more open to the idea that at certain points or among certain groups of Yahweh worshippers to have to have an image of the deity was perfectly normative. So when Yahweh says in the Ten Commandments, you know, you shall not you shall not create an image, you shall not have an image. It's very much a kind of that suggests that some people were mm. used to be banned. So quite often you can draw um certain kinds of analogies in terms of the ways in which some of this ritual language is used of of Yahweh, you know, that you shall go and present yourself before in his presence before his face. I mean, this is not just talking, you know, metaphorically again, it's talking about ancient ritual ways of coming into a, a social relationship with the divine in a physical space. Thank you. And I have to ask about the footprints on the blue book, because I believe those are from a temple. Oh, yeah. Um, there's this extraordinary temple in Syria uh, called Ayn Dara. And um, it's probably, you know, it looks to be sort of Syro-Hittite. So, but dates to, it probably dates from late Bronze Age, but in its in later iterations, which are, we have the remnants of now, um, it is Iron Age. And it's this gorgeous temple, but but set into the temple floor, carved into the temple floor from right from its threshold and sort of striding into the Holy of Holies in the temple are these enormous footprints. And these represent the footprints of whichever deity it was that, that dwelt in that temple. We, we don't, we can't know for sure. Um, some people think it's a form of Ishtar. Other people think that it's it's a it's a male deity of some sort. We don't know, but but these incredible footprints striding at the temple are representing the the entrance of the deity into the temple. And it's important that those footprints go just one way. You know, they only yeah. go, they don't leave again. This is about this. You know, a temple is the meeting place of the heavenly and earthly realms, and this is where you can encounter the deity. This is where the deity is. I mean, the really devastating thing about it, I mean, I, I visited the temple um, back in 2010, 11, just before the war in Syria started. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously that the chaos in that particular part of the world has been horrible. Um, but one of the things that happened back in 2018 is that the temple was destroyed in a Turkish airstrike against what seems to be against local Kurdish communities there. So it's pretty much rubble which is devastating it's devastating when war afflicts people on animals obviously um but i, I was really upset when that when the, i saw these images um of the temple in ruins and these gorgeous footprints kind of decimated mm -hmm. but that's the footprints on the on the um on the cover of the book I, I chose those um because i talk about this temple in the book and i draw a parallel between this particular temple iconography and um, a refrain of this kind of motif that we find throughout the Hebrew Bible of Yahweh saying the Jerusalem temple is the place for the soles of his feet. You know, this is where he will set his feet. This is where his feet will reside, you know, will be placed forever. So it's the same kind of idea that literally these his feet are planted in the Jerusalem temple. That's a wonderful image. That's oh, I love that. I got chills. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank you. So, um, obviously, for those who have not picked up the book yet, A, you really should, um, but B, it's arranged in, um, as you would kind of expect, like, specific body parts have their own specific chapters. Um, did you have a particular chapter that was maybe unexpected to write or that you enjoyed particularly more than one of the others? Or was just the whole thing an absolute pleasure? It was mostly an absolute pleasure. The hardest chapter to write was the first chapter in which I'm just sort of saying, this is what the Bible is. And this is when, it, you know, because that kind of stuff, you can't assume that your reader knows anything about, you know, the ancient mm -hmm. origins of these texts. And um, so that was hard. Um, but yeah, no, the chapters I really enjoyed writing. I really enjoyed writing about God, God's kind of um, emotional life. And within an ancient Southwest Asian context and um, biblical context, um, his emotions are very, are very, bodily um so they're felt very much you know so a lot of emotions are felt in the stomach and in the bowel um and so i i really enjoyed writing about his inner organs um quite enjoyed writing about whether jesus defecated or not that was <laughs> um, what conclusion did you come to on that front well i i explored I, I i touched on both whether moses defecated on top of mount sinai and uh, whether jesus defecated because these were like major kind of contentious theological issues um particularly 
in the first few centuries of the common era. Um, because in the case of Jesus, it really impacted on ideas about, well, was he fully divine or was he fully mm -hmm. human? Um, and within Jewish context in particular, it really impacted on the idea about, well, you know, can there be shit in heaven? Do angels, you know, if angels, can angels eat and drink? Can there yeah. Could Moses really have, you know, he was 40 days and nights on Mount Sinai. So did he go to the toilet or not? But if he did, that would have had implications in terms of, you know, would this have been seen as somehow polluting the divine mm -hmm. space? in which the deity dwells on top of Mount Sinai. So these are like hugely important Big questions. Issues. Yeah. So I really enjoyed writing about that. Um, and and uh, I mean, you have to kind of go with what the rabbis say primarily about Moses, which was that, no, you know, he um, he managed to empty his bowels uh, and then fasted for all that time. So didn't need to, to poo on Mount Sinai. Um, but, you know, it was it, with it, when it comes to Jesus, I mean, you know, theologians were fiercely arguing about it. Some said, no, he only appeared to eat and drink so he wouldn't need to defecate because he was far too holy to, to you know, to have to kind of um, produce like, mm -hmm. poo, basically what they call corrupt matter, to produce poo, let alone to expel it. From <laughs> as, sorry, as someone who has been potty training a toddler for too, far too long, corrupt matter is now my new favourite way yeah, of referring to faecal matter. But then other, other theologians were horrified at, you know, at the idea that he wouldn't have defecated because if he didn't defecate, he wasn't, human. he wasn't human. And if he wasn't human, then how could he really have died on the cross and therefore resurrected? So it was a really, it was big theological that, No, problem. that's a huge problem. But I, but I, enjoyed, I, I particularly enjoyed writing about those things. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Um, uh, <laughs> Sorry, that was not the answer I was expecting, but it was a perfect yeah, exactly. answer. And it kind of takes you over, doesn't it? And then you start, you, you start on this train of thought and you think, no, I need to stop the train and get off now. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when people are reading, what is the main takeaway maybe or the, the overriding idea that you hope they will take away from the book? Um, I hope that they understand that, um, A, that the Bible belongs to all of us and it's not just, you know, it's not just the property of religious people um, mm -hmm. and that religious people. So a confessional theological perspective on these texts, um, you know, that they, you know, priests and rabbis don't have the monopoly on this kind of stuff. Um, and it's a remarkable collection of texts. And I want people to kind of appreciate just how rich the Bible is in that sense. But I also want them to understand that, you know, I, I wrote this book for people who are like me, I think, you know, for people who are, not necessarily religious at all, but people that who are curious about well, where, you know, where does this God come from? How come we ended up worshiping, you know, how come this God is the only ancient God who has actually survived into the modern day? Um, you know, all the other brilliant, wonderful ancient gods and goddesses have fallen by the wayside. So how come, you know, Why this, is this one? one that survived? And really what the, this book is showing is, is a really important part of that journey is to say, how did you get, how did this deity move from being a god who was you know of, of typical ancient mythological context into a deity who became the kind of figurehead for a, for a more cutting edge kind of jewish early jewish metaphysics and then a christian kind of metaphysical deity so um so yeah that's that's what i hope people will take away from the book and also it's got gorgeous pictures in it lots of lovely iconography and archaeological artifacts um so even just for the pictures alone it's it's a lovely book i think <laughs> We like we enjoy a, a good book with with excellent archaeological pictures because too often they're just they're not good or they don't exist and and pictures make everything more I don't want to say more real but it's it's much easier I think to grasp yeah. sometimes what's being talked about and this book is very much about you know the visual the visuals of God if you like it's it's, it's about yeah. the optics yeah. and and you know I need to be able to show the reader. Well, you know, look at this particular artifact. Look at this particular day. Look, see how pretty. And they're, they're beautiful pictures. Yeah. They really are. So, yeah, I'm, I hope that people will, um, will, even if they just turn to the pictures first, and then it will make them want to actually read the words. Because the words are good as well. <laughs> I was, I was uh, for viewers watching, I was mentioning to Dr. Savrakapulu that I have not had the chance to actually read this book yet, which is to my eternal shame. Um, but I'm really excited about it because it just, the concept is fascinating to me and the evidence that I think is going to be presented is, is something that I'm also genuinely very interested in. I got into the study of the ancient world because of religion, because I find ancient religions 
absolutely fascinating. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that um, placing the Old Testament, placing the Hebrew Bible back in its ancient context is incredibly important and very necessary for understanding it as a group of texts that you're right, is kind of a monolith in the modern world and is mm-hmm. everywhere. Um, and in a, in presented in a very different way to how they would have been presented in the original context. So being able to understand it and and see kind of how ancient people related to this and related to their deity, I think is incredibly important. Um, so I'm looking forward to reading it and I really hope that people who are watching this um, go and, and pick it up themselves and, and have a read through and hopefully learn something interesting. So, I hope so, yeah, I hope so. I mean, that's why we write these books, isn't it? It's because, mm-hmm. you know, obviously I, I really enjoyed writing it, but um, but I know I, I want people to get as excited about this ancient stuff as I am. So, um, so yeah, I hope, I hope, well, I know you'll enjoy it. Oh, I will. I'll love it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure I am not the only one. I'm just going to like come out and say it now. Francesca, wonderful as though she is, did not write this just for me. Um, <laughs> I am deeply grateful she wrote it at all, but I think a lot of other people will um, enjoy it an awful lot. So thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, we are going to wrap up here um, because Francesca has a life to go to and I have babies who will be waking up relatively soon. Um, but Dr. Stavrakopoulou, thank you so much for joining us again. It's oh, been a delight. It's always lovely to talk to you. <laughs> oh, and you. And everybody, thank you for watching this. I hope that you enjoyed it again the book is God and Anatomy by Dr. Francesca Stavrakopoulou. You should go, you should buy it, you should read it, and then tell me what you think, because I am genuinely interested to know. Uh, and until next time, resist poor scholarship. Always ask, how do you know that? <laughs> Digital Hammurabi is made possible by generous sponsorship from our patrons. Their support means that we have the technological and academic resources necessary to bring the ancient world directly to you. If you want to join the team, Go to patreon.com forward slash digital Hammurabi to see how you can help.